Ladies and gentlemen, uh, some problems with connection, no? No? Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us uh, start the workshop uh, uh, Human Rights uh, on the Internet, Legal Frames and Technological Implications. The initiative of this workshop belongs to the representatives of academic community of uh, Russian National Research University Higher School of Economics, Mo Moscow. Uh, let me introduce you, the panelists. Uh, uh, I, um, my name is Svetlana Maltsova. I'm a dean of uh, business informatics Depart departments of uh, uh, Higher School of Economics. And uh, then uh, I will introduce uh, the panelists from my right hand to the left. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to introduce uh, uh, Wolfgang uh, Klein Dechter. Uh, he is a professor of uh, international uh, communication policy and uh, regulation at the Department for Media and Information Studies of the University of, of Aarhus in Denmark. Uh, then I want to introduce Jeremy Malcolm. Jeremy is a uh, um, consumer international senior policy and project officer for consumers in digital age. Uh, he is from Malaysia. Uh, Mikhail Komarov, uh, my colleague, uh, and uh, he is a lecturer in HSE. Also, Mikhail is uh, co founder of uh, All Russian Public Organization Young Innovative Russia. Uh, Roxana uh, Radu is a PhD candidate in uh, International uh, Relations Political Science at uh, the um, Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, Andrei Sherbovich, lecturer of Faculty of Law of uh, HSE, and Anna Jarova, uh, an assistant professor of HSE. Unfortunately, uh, Paul Vixi, the chairman of uh, uh, founder of and founder of Internet Systems Consortium, will be later. Uh, the um, agenda of workshop uh, include uh, the session of reports of uh, panelists and the session of uh, questions and uh, general discussion. You can see the agenda on the screen. Uh, for me, as uh, for representative of academic uh, community, uh, the main idea of this workshop seems to be a synergy effects uh, of uh, uh, collaboration between representatives of different areas of knowledge um, to provide new ideas uh, for the field of uh, providing human rights. Uh, also, we uh, organized the uh, remote session, and uh, I want to welcome uh, the students and uh, <coughs> staff of uh, uh, Higher School of Economics, where this session will be held. Uh, uh, I want to welcome all of them and uh, to invite them to join us. Uh, OK, uh, so we begin. and. Uh, uh, I will start uh, from uh, uh, our joint uh, report with Mikhail, uh, and uh, as you can see in our agenda, we uh, will move uh, from uh, technological problems to uh, uh, to uh, legal questions. Uh, 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 first of all, I uh, want to make. Um, short uh, introduction uh, to our report and uh, then Mikhail will um, uh, present the main ideas. Um, as, you can, uh, as you can see, the internet technologies uh, uh, contribute uh, to the practical realization of human rights. Uh, first of all, they can improve uh, the effectiveness uh, of um, existing institution. For example, uh, e-learning. It's new for me as I am a professor of the university. Uh, this type of training uh, allows you to implement uh, the right to education uh, for people 
who are unable to study in ordinary schools or, and universities, for example, people with disabilities. But you must ensure that uh, the uh, technology and content uh, have the necessary quality and, uh, use protect and uh, are protected from fraud. Also, we can see uh, the organizational transformation based on Internet technologies and uh, the emergence of new institutions. Another example, uh, social professional networks. Uh, we see that uh, they can have a great uh, impact on the uh, forming and um, distribution of knowledge. Unfortunately, in the same uh, time, Internet technologies give rise to new mechanisms in terms uh, of human rights violation. So we need uh, new uh, means, new technologies uh, uh, for protection. Uh, we uh, need new restrictions, including technological means, uh, uh, identification and classification of violations, uh, uh, prevention based on uh, predictive analytics. Uh, but um, what we need, uh, what we really need uh, uh, to improve the situation, um, uh, should we improve uh, the should should we improve uh, the existing uh, means, or uh, we must build new models of communication. Uh, perhaps uh, such model could be uh, the model based on uh, the concept of uh, Web 3.0. And uh, I want to give the microphone uh, to uh, Mikhail, who will present our ideas uh, about uh, these possibilities. Thank you very much. Um, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start with a um, presentation about technological and legal aspects uh, of human rights and the synergetic effect of, sorry, just a second. So, um, dear colleagues, um, I would like to start the presentation um, about human rights on the internet. Um, with some information from our past. <laughs> uh, it is necessary to emphasize that problem of um, protecting human rights appeared many years ago, when first we were able to transfer data with the use of technical devices. Um, as you can see on the slide, um, mobile networks were implemented as their first prototypes uh, in 1946, actually 1947, directly with you know this physical prototype. Problem of protection of the data um, more serious when we are talking about United Technological Networks as it's always vulnerable to the intrusions of third-party technological devices or, or programs. Uh, human rights protection became more important and uh, more vulnerable when we got the internet more than 40 years ago as a concept and actually as it started uh, quite popular uh, I think almost 30 years ago, right? And the special actual problem when we got um, social networks and started uploading our personal and private data under our account and social networks, truly believing that no one except us won't be able to get information from our account, even when it's tagged available only for me. Um, in terms of um, current technological progress, it is necessary to remind that almost 20 years ago, there were only few people around the world carrying the cell phones. Um, nowadays, uh, we have cell phones everywhere. It's not a luxury thing, but a necessity. Legal aspects of using cell phones are still in progress depending on the different countries. Somewhere you need to show your passport and or your ID. Somewhere you can buy a SIM card uh, or a cell phone without any documents, which means that no one would know who is using the particular cell phone number and who transmits the data, actually. At the same time, cell phones are our sensors, and all we are part of the big global network telephone network, which is much more bigger than social networking. Before the smartphones, we were generally using just telephonic functions of the cell phones, but after integration, there are additional features, and explaining this functionality, we are carrying micro-PC as a small information bomb every day with us. 
typical cell phone today has GPS, camera, Wi-Fi module, and 3G or LTE additional modems functionality, which means that it's easy today to get your position, uh, to see what you see or doing with your cell phone, and transfer all this data to the particular servers. This mobile era, which is called the Web3 era, evaluates uh, with the marketable support of innovation and higher necessities. The new technology has the, uh, has the capability to supply more real time in turn. So, this information uh, comprises location, weather, traffic, local business, and the visits to store frequencies. So, um, this also provides a um, new industry opening. No one can assure you that you are safe while using your cell phones, for instance. From the recent incidents, it is necessary to remind about the incidents with, you know, with an iPhone or iPad devices while they were recording your position. Or some other incidents uh, which are still take place um, when you might be connected to the fake base station and pay additional money for the calls and text and uh, transfer your personal data to them. Only from the recent times, some applications were proposed to check the base station. There are many examples of how, um, how applications, um, uh, how our rights actually uh, for the private life, for the privacy, were violated and how companies or hackers break into our privacy. Um, the Web 3.0 concept has many different meanings, but all of them consider using information by the machines. Um, just Web or Web 1, uh, 1.0, the information web was straightforward enough. It was full of static content that could be seen as an extension of offline media, such as print and TV. Uh, this version of the web was uh, able to provide information to users in a broadcast model of information distribution. The next evaluation of the web brought about Web 3.0, uh, Web 2.0, was a social web, which is characterized by users' communications, contributing and collaborating. Web 2.0 uh, has empowered users and consumers of the web to shift from being passive consumers of content and information into active producers of content and information. It allows users to equally participate in the production of content creation and in sharing that content with a wider audience online. Web 3.0 means that our things, our belongings, uh, will have the power to learn, intuit, and decide. Uh, web 3.0 is a semantic web. Uh, it's a virtual uh, environment or 3D internet. Uh, Web 3.0 is a smart commerce, and Web 3.0 is the Internet of Things. Um, it's our future in terms of our life, but it's our tomorrow in terms of how fast is technological progress integrating new devices into our life. That's why it's necessary to focus on this aspect. Um, of course, um, you can see, um, you know, uh, current solutions already implemented to protect our data and being able to filter in appropriate content of the websites or internet-based services for our children and actually ourselves as well. Um, there are two main areas, so hardware protection and software protection, which means that uh, in terms of hardware, uh, all of our data coming in and out of the PC or our devices connected to the internet filtered via special, special firewalls and hardware devices. And another area, uh, software area, uh, when we directly connected to the internet with our PC or our mobile device, and data which is coming to our PC is filtered directly on the PC, and actually sometimes, most of the time, uh, we are managing that process. Um, and uh, it's quite hard to protect the data coming out of the PC this way, because uh, we can assure ourselves that uh, we've sent data to the particular address, and the data would pass through some other PCs or external services. Um, which means that you know our data might be protected only via special encryption systems. Um, and there are of course special legal acts and regulations considering inappropriate use of our personal data in Russia. Uh, all the content providers must give access to the special services or special securities and you know and in case special situations to the authorized representative of the governmental structures. But no one can assure you that your data wouldn't be sent to the internet just because we've got third party accessing your data, even in special cases. At the same time, uh, all the internet providers have their own filtration of the data passing through their servers, which means that they're able to collect your emails, all the private information you're sending and receiving via their servers. And it is a good idea to focus your attention on the fact that some internet providers, they don't sign any legal documents uh, saying that they wouldn't pass your data to the third parties uh, in case of Russia. 
uh, of course there are special leads of media or press at the internet they have to register themselves with special governmental structures um, there is a special law saying that everyone dealing with the personal information of someone should receive confirmation written confirmation from the person uh, granting the right to deal with that information. We also got special governmental list, uh, blacklist of the websites or content providers which, um, uh, which regulates uh, some particular websites. And there's actually no public discussions about the sites or content providers uh, which should be blocked. There's only governmental commission which makes a decision. Right now, we're also in the process of implementing special encryption services, uh, personal encryption services, and the digital signature, at least to work with governmental organizations as uh, e-government uh, for, for identification data, which passes uh, to, to the governmental structures. Um, there are some synergies um, in terms of uh, synergetic effect of technologies and uh, legal uh, regulations. Uh, we are talking about special regulation policies, um, about certification association or special organization, uh, which uh, probably should provide uh, some special permission for the particular types of data on the particular websites to, um, to, to secure our kids from inappropriate content. Um, web 3.0 as a semantic web or web of things lives according to the special rules. Uh, it should live, actually, uh, according to the special ru uh, rules provided by the certified association. Probably uh, there should be a, a special improvements of the website, um, which inform you know, uh, information on which should be uh, um, somehow uh, secured and approved. Uh, also, we are talking about mobile networks. Uh, services should be provided only after confirmation by the user and notifications of the user. In Russia, uh, just recently we got that law which uh, uh, regulates this. Uh, also, uh, personal data protection by the law and special requirements of the databases. Uh, we have uh, special databases uh, collecting and uh, probably cloud-based services uh, keeping our personal data. So there should be special uh, protection laws and, and legal regulations about it. Uh, I would be happy to discuss it. Um, and there are also some ideas um, how it might work in the future. Uh, as I said, um, in terms of technological progress, our future is coming quite fast. Um, so there are some proposals. Um, in my opinion, we should consider our experience in protecting our physical belongings in terms of banking services, private storages, um, also our personal data. Uh, there are some doubts about granting access to the governmental organizations to personal data. Probably there should be a personal data officer which would deal with particular people and particular people's data. At least we would know exactly the person who would get access to our personal information, including our social status, banking accounts, numbers, insurance numbers, etc. Um, I would be happy to answer on your questions. And uh, actually, um, during the uh, questions and answers session, um, I would also like to ask you some questions. How we ensure synergy effect between new technologies and legal regulations in your opinion? I have my own opinion, I will tell about it later. And uh, do you think there should be legal regulations to the services like hardware software which provide personal data in terms of amount or number of uh, particular types of personal data um, returned to the inquiry from the website for instance? And another question, do you think there should be special improvement of the websites for the Web 3.0 usage uh, when we're talking about things using and uh, uh, using information from the websites? So inf that information should be reliable, but we should think about special regulations about it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Um, so, uh, we can uh, start the next report. Uh, Anna and Andrei uh, will uh, tell us about uh, the problems of adaptation of technological solutions to the uh, changing legal in environment. Um, Andrei, you will be first, yes?
Okay, dear colleagues. My name is Andrei Sherbovich. I am a lecturer of the Faculty of Law of the National Research University Higher School of Economics, and my colleague, Dr. Anna Zharova, is a, a assistant professor of the Faculty of Business Informatics, and will present together a report named the adaptation of technical solutions to the changing legal environments. So let's begin with the special concept of the internet governance which was developed some years ago by the group of uh, scientists of the higher school of economics which is uh, the trilateral model of internet governance. At first there are three levels on which internet governance should be possible in sphere of realization of the human rights. They are supranational, national, and community level or self-regulation. Those three levels <coughs> couldn't be uh, declared as self-sufficient and should be connected to each other in a special way in order to uh, make a relevant il internet governance in order to make a model of IG policy in the uh, realization of human rights. So, each level has its posi positive and negative effect so that uh, each of them couldn't be proclaimed and declared self-sufficient. At first I'll talk about the supranational level which is uh, like a multi-stakeholder approach of the IGF and other forums and uh, open discussing spaces provided by the United Nations, by the regional uh, Internet Governance Forum and uh, forums and other organizations. It's also a participatory approach which uh, anyone could be attended in discussion and anyone have a uh, stock for decision making. It's also an open-minded uh, and complete and scientifically sound analysis of the problems of the internet governance and also the internet governance itself, itself uh, better reflects uh, on international level the supranational nature of the internet itself. But uh, by the way this uh, supranational level uh, uh, on his own couldn't, uh, could have negative aspects because it's uh, the only the discussion space which have no decision making official power to make uh, uh, international treaties which are ma have a mandatory force. Also not all the national juris jurisdiction in, uh, in this uh, perceive their jurisdiction in the same way. So their, this recommendation could be recognized in different way in different countries. Also, most of the uh, decisions and uh, proposals made by uh, such a discussion space are uh, on the base have ethical or not a legal nature. Other uh, aspects that a pr principle different position sometimes which couldn't be uh, on in peace with each other that different organizations had different positions for example on internet filtering on other issues like that because of them a lot of uh, actors and stakeholders and in inside this process So its functional assignment is development of the sound, uh, scientifically sound uh, internet governance policy. It's counseling, sometimes promotions of ethical standards of regulation, making uh, other uh, rules uh, or like a proposal for, for international treaties and other. Also the monitoring of internet governance policies in realization of human rights around the world. The uh, second level is national level, it's the internet governance which uh, regulated by the national states. At first uh, their positive as aspects are 
that the well, uh, they have well-defined members and the regulatory proce process within and the legally bound laws to, ma uh, to implement it. Also, traditional cl clear mechanism for protecting citizens by the normal uh, judicial way. Also, the uh, normal national jurisdiction should be uh, should use <coughs> implemented uh, on the at the national level uh, rules and norms of international law, which are which have a guarantee of realization of human rights. But they also have a negative aspects, as uh, other. Uh, levels so it's a possi possible abuse of power by the law enforcement system of each country it's imperfect legislation which is uh, absent for, for the real development of uh, technologies also uh, possible threats of corruption and red tapes on nas national re jurisdictions which couldn't be part of in which uh, protection of people couldn't be po possible and also insufficient legal culture and uh, uh, legal lit lit literacy of users internet users in sphere of protection of their rights on the internet the functional assignment of the national level is ratification of the international standards in the treaties and convention or in sphere of internet governance. It's establishing favor favorable legal environment in sphere of internet governance. Also, protection of constitutional rights and freedoms uh, by traditional judi judicial and administrative bodies. And also, prevention of views on information rights by impo imposing legal restrictions based on constitutional provisions to defend uh, constitutional interests of state as well as as citizen for example morality health constitutional uh, interest and other national defense and security as well and the third and the most moment and the most controversial level of internet governance involved in the realization of human rights and freedoms is the community level and al it also have positive and negative aspects is the community level is based on commu web communities established on the major and oh, as uh, as a rule very big websites and web resources like wikipedia like uh, youtube like facebook and other it has uh, very competent communities of users for example, is freedom of actions of individuals on these websites, or also the possibility of diversi diversification of regulatory policy in the I independence of the uh, website and its functional structure. And you can see other positive way, uh, things uh, which related to community level of internet governance. Also, it has negative aspects that the user agreements which uh, on which this level is based are uh, definitely optional for users and seems optional and it's very depending on the legal and information culture of users also uh, sometimes those rules of user agreements of the major web resources are uh, not really consistent with the real law and legal protection also, this is conflict of jurisdiction in which uh, users are sitting in one place, one country. Website is registered in another country. Administration of the website is sitting in a third country. And uh, it's not possible in which court is competent, has competent jurisdiction to protect uh, rights if they were abused by the website administration. Uh, also, this, uh, as I've said, uh, those rules uh, and this obed in its obedience are also uh, uh, very depending on the ethics of users and the, their legal and information culture. Its functional assignment is uh, the the major functional assignment of the community level of internet governance. It's the 
formation and establishment of the social networks on the different websites, elaboration of rules of conduct, and settlement of disputes among users of different websites. For example, we have an af another situation when uh, the illegal contact, uh, content uh, is posted on the big website, like the YouTube, for example, and the court in Russia uh, might have a decision to ban this website, uh, all the website. For uh, instance, it is better to call to to contact the administration, and wish possible to to delete this illegal contact by decision of the administration according to the internal rules of the web resource. Also, the functional assignment of uh, the community level of internet governance is development of uh, standard of. Uh, uh, rules on uh, of internet governance of different internet resources, development of uh, community of users and their legal information culture. As well I've said, uh, I am com com completing my part of the report. I'd like to say that none of those levels of uh, internet governance in sphere of protection of human rights couldn't be self-sufficient. Uh, all of them should be interconnected and interdependent with each other. So, thank you. I'd like to forward the word uh, to my colleague, Dr. Anna Zharova, which could uh, explain the situation in Russia and different problems on human rights on the in sphere of Internet governance in the arising in the Russian legislation and jurisdiction. Thank you, Andrei and Anna. You uh, will... Uh, uh, if it, uh, if it uh, is uh, possible, I will uh, present from the my place. My second part uh, is about uh, particularly uh, legal problems uh, of the safety of the intellectual rights in the Internet in the Russian Federation. Uh, constitution, uh, uh, constitution of the Russian Federation defines important uh, rights of citizens of Russia, the right to creative activity. It means that uh, the state must provide to the citizen effective juridical safety remedies of those rights. But does it mean that IP right protection of the particular persons is uh, the main activity for uh, the government? Protection of the intellectual rights is connected with uh, those legal mechanisms which are provided by the legislation. The analysis uh, of providing this uh, right in the Russian Federation allows uh, conclude, uh, concluding that uh, the problem, problems are. The problems are present, uh, presented uh, on the slide. Uh, so about uh, the first problem. Uh, it consists. It is necessary that the subject of information relation must be identified as accurately as possible because the subject exists not only in information relation. Uh, so, seven other legal terms are considered in the Russian legislation. They to define go between in the internet. Uh, point two: uh, the courts make ambiguous damage assessment part to the owner. Uh, the big problem of damage assessment of uh, intellectual property result placement in the internet. It is connected with the technological possibilities to change frequency of uh, visit of a site. And also these problems of the proofs uh, of that uh, this result of intellectual property was uh, downloaded. Point three, uh, uh, they, every organization makes rules of the damage estimates of result of intellectual property. The uh, courts uh, are able not to be considered the rules. Uh, moreover, uh, the court in each case actually should construct a forecast of economic efficiency of the invasion useful for ensuring protection, it is necessary to have a regulation of the relation. 
rules uh, of the relationship between provider and user and owner are uh, absent. However, in 2012, new article about creation of the regist uh, register of the forbidden sites is introduced in the information legislation of the Russian Federation. It is about child protection from harmful information. Point four. Uh, after the accession of the Russian Federation to the WTO, the government of the Russian Federation decided to unify patency for invasion and the trademarks raised uh, from Russians uh, and foreigners. However, levels of economic policy of the state on patent privileges are still not effective. For example, students' intellectual work not always are registered because uh, of the high pay, uh, patent fees. Point five. Uh, in Russia, in uh, 2011, was signed uh, the new law about the sign. This law facilitated uh, confirmation uh, of a written form uh, of the license signed in the Internet. Uh, point uh, six. Technical rules of the counteraction uh, cybercrime in certain cases are not effective. Point seven. Rules of the realization of online right application use no effective. There are the experience of use of various technologies within trial in Russia. Virtual courts are now in, now in progress of establishment. That will accelerate this process of the dispute's uh, resolution in the Internet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and uh, I want uh, to announce uh, the uh, next report that will do uh, Jeremy Malcolm. Uh, he will present uh, the report, Human Rights and the Future of Internet Governance. Please, Malcolm. Thanks very much. Well, um, the presentations so far have been very diverse, and uh, so I'm going to restrict my remarks um, to the area that Andre's presentation covered, which um, was about the uh, different levels of internet regulation, as he explained, uh, the supranational level, the national level, and uh, self-regulation, or regulation at the community level, as he called it. And uh, I'm also drawing some of my remarks from uh, my paper in this year's Mind volume, which was edited by Professor Kleinvector here. Um, so the premise of uh, Andre's presentation is that not all internet regulation can be handled at the global level, and that's obviously true. But we cannot be completely free to regulate at the national level where human rights are concerned, because human rights are inherently global. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was established as a global instrument precisely because the national democratic process is not sufficient by itself to ensure that an individual country will respect human rights within its borders. This is because, by definition, democracy means majority rule. And sometimes the majority does not wish to respect the human rights, particularly of minorities or foreigners. So, uh, for example, freedom of expression is the freedom to speak out when the majority wishes you wouldn't and would shut you up if they could. The same is true of human rights in general. They are protections against the tyranny of the democratic majority. So what this means is that even democratic governments may not always be inclined to support human rights in the absence of international or supranational pressure. So that's one important reason why we establish human rights standards at the supranational level. But the national level sometimes comes back in because human rights aren't always 100% culturally neutral. A good example of this recently came up with the tension between um, freedom of expression and the regulation of hate speech in the case of the anti-Islamic film, The Innocence of Muslims. The Universal Declaration doesn't have much to say about this sort of situation, because partly because the Islamic world had little input into the original drafting of the Universal Declaration. And that's one reason why, in turn, the uh, Organization of Islamic States has put forward alternative <coughs> instruments that they claim are more compatible with Sharia law. So does this mean that we should have regional or national human rights instruments rather than global ones? Uh, my answer is no, uh, largely in the case of the internet because the internet doesn't operate that way. We have no borders online. So uh, 
acts that are conducted in one jurisdiction often spill over into other jurisdictions, uh, particularly where the internet is concerned. So we have to try and make the regulation of the internet work for human rights at a global level first and foremost, and only regulate at a national or regional level when we have to in order to avoid culturally unjust outcomes. And to minimise the overreaching potential of such national or regional policies, it's important to fully exhaust the potential for the development and application of principles at a supranational level before an edge case devolves to the domestic level for cultural or other reasons. So in the case of the hate speech and, and defamation of religion, this means that we would have a global default regulation, which is freedom, because that respects the human rights of the greatest number of internet users worldwide, and only where that falls down in particular cultures do we have to look at allowing a national level override to that global default policy. So who decides on this? In the case of the Innocence of Muslims video, who decided whether it would be available or not? It was Google. Um, now that's obviously not appropriate in the longer term, not because Google necessarily decided in, on this in a bad way, but because they're a for-profit company. They may be a for-profit company that wishes not to be evil, but that's beside the point, right? Respecting human rights is something that they do because they happen to be a good corporate citizen, not because there is any global instrument that applies to them that they're morally or legally bound to comply with. So this points to the fact that we can't rely on individual governments to respect human rights. We can't rely on corporations to do so. And civil society, well, certainly we can act as a human rights watchdog and we can provide certain tools to help with the exercise of human rights online, but we have nowhere near enough power or resources or influence to make much of a difference on our own account. So how do we regulate the internet in a way that respects human rights if we can't rely on governments, corporations or civil society to do so? The best answer we have is that we should do so by combining the strengths and weaknesses of all those stakeholders in a multi-stakeholder policy development process intended to explicate common principles or guidelines upon which governments, the private sector and civil society can agree as a basis for their respective actions, such as passing legislation or concluding treaties, moderating online services containing user-generated content, and inculcating shared norms of online behaviour. The Internet Governance Forum can be a good place to start developing global policies for human rights online, particularly in areas where there are no other global fora that have responsibility for particular issues, such as, for example, uh, privacy and cloud services. However, the IGF, as it's currently constituted, isn't quite up to the task. Its mandate does call on it to develop recommendations on emerging issues that can be transmitted to decision makers through appropriate high-level interfaces. Um, but it hasn't yet developed the capacity to, 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 to do that. And the Tunes Agenda furthermore calls for a parallel process towards enhanced cooperation on internet-related public policy issues, which more explicitly includes the development of globally applicable principles on public policy issues, involving all stakeholders in their respective roles and led by governments on an equal footing. So we have some more work to do to improve the processes at the global level and we also have to make sure that similar fora exist at the regional and national levels too. In this context, it's been good to hear at this Internet Governance Forum that there will be another attempt to convene a working group on enhanced cooperation under the auspices of the Commission on Science and Technology for Development. The ultimate uh, outcome that we should be aiming for is to ensure that we have the means to address at all levels, supranational, national and local, um, the means to work towards a multi-stakeholder consensus on the appropriate principles to be applied by all stakeholders in their respective roles that will address online policy problems while upholding human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. And um, mm, our next report will do Roxana Radu, uh, Dynamics Between Internet Governance and Human Rights at the International Level. Please, uh, please, Roxana. Thank you. So while there is some consensus on what the international arena might consist of, I think there are still people who would question whether human rights are actually universal and whether their socialization into these international norms uh, can actually make it possible that they become universal. 
the intersection of human rights with internet governance is in itself an emerging topic. Uh, and these processes are developing as we are speaking right now. And this, this is what makes this workshop uh, very timely, I believe, and I hope we can get uh, something out of it that would enhance the discussion further on. I would like to point out a couple of tensions um, we need to take into account in actually moving forward with this debate. First, I would start by outlining the issue of interpretation. One of the questions that comes up first is whether to treat the human rights regime in a comprehensive way, in a comprehensive manner, as the so-called uh, package of intersecting rights, um, or whether to keep the rights separated and have this list of um, independent things. We already have several core legal instruments in place at the international level, but uh, their interpretation is by no means uncontroversial. Uh, access to internet, for example, as a human right has been derived from several articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, such as Article 2 on equality, Article 19 on freedom of expression, uh, or Article 26 on education. Secondly, at the international, an international human rights regime remains strongly dependent on enforcement, which is done through governments and through the um, court system. The tension here is between two conflicting paradigms. On the one hand, the traditional human rights regime, which um, assigns a major role to the states, and on the other hand, uh, an emerging internet rights paradigm in which uh, the role of the state is um, kept at a minimal or is ideally kept at a minimal. And discussions are now going on regarding a set of norms applicable to the internet, but also in regard with uh, conceiving, for example, different frameworks of intellectual property rights. And this, has, this is an area in which the state has traditionally been uh, involved in and has had a very strong hand so far. Uh, the internet has enabled individuals to bypass copyright, but some recent legislative proposals such as SOPA, PIPA, ACTAM, uh, have revealed consistent attempts at using uh, the private sector to control online content, both with, within and beyond national jurisdiction, which raises a series of concern as to first, the accountability of the private sector, uh, in the human rights regime as we conceive of it today, and second, the potential instances of uh, policy laundering, uh, which refer to this changing international regulation uh, by, by the means of using um, international treaties. Um, a third underlying problem is um, um, the tension between um, the internet as a borderless environment and the degree of variation between um, states in what concerns um, what is considered lawful or unlawful and what is acceptable. Here we can um, think of for pornography, copyright, uh, but also political dissent. In this sense, the dual use nature of certain instruments seems to be most problematic. In certain cases, what is deployed for enforcing criminal laws online can also be used for suppressing uh, opposition movements in certain politically sensitive contexts, either directly or indirectly by enhancing surveillance and monitoring. In the UN ambit, I want to point out two recent um, important developments. The first one of them is the uh, report of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, uh, which concluded that states have a positive obligation to, and I quote, promote and facilitate the enjoyment of the right of freedom of expression and the means necessary to express this right, including the internet, end of quotation, and that the internet should be a priority on the state agendas around the world. The other recent event that uh, is worth pointing out in this uh, context, I think, is the landmark resolution uh, passed by the UN uh, Human Rights Council just uh, in July this year on the freedom of expression on the internet, affirming that, and this is a quote, the same rights that people have offline must be protected online, in particular the freedom of expression, which is applicable regardless of uh, frontier and through any media of one's choice, end of quotation. However, this document has a non-binding value, uh, but it still uh, shows that uh, important steps forward are taken and um, they acknowledge the importance of uh, freedom of expression and more broadly of um, 
an online human rights regime that is now developing. Thank you. Thank you, Roxana. And um, I want uh, to ask uh, Wolfgang uh, Kleinwechter to uh, summarize the opinions of uh, our panelists. Okay, thank you very much. And first of all, I want to thank the organizers of this workshop uh, to uh, provide the space here for discussion about technology, law, and human rights. I think it's a very welcome initiative because if I remember the previous IGFs, we had only a low participation of uh, friends from the Russian Federation, and I take this as a very good signal that uh, you know uh, the Russian Federation, as a big country, you know, which has a large internet community, becomes stronger involved in um, the discussion of internet governance in this multi-stakeholder environment. So I think this is certainly a positive signal, and we can learn from each other, listening to the various arguments and understanding better concepts, because very often we are using the same language but have a different meaning behind the same words, and this creates sometimes then some problems because that uh, we have misunderstandings. And the, um, the beauty of the Internet Governance Forum is that we have here an opportunity to look behind the words, to have individual discussions with uh, speakers and people from other stakeholder groups, other nations, and to find out, you know, what is behind the word, what is the real meaning. This helps us to create understanding. <coughs> it's difficult to summarize the debate here because we had well-elaborated individual statements, and it's not certainly my task to squeeze out and to say this was good and this was bad. Um, what I want to do here in my five minutes is um, to, to do more of a reflection about the relationship in this triangle between technology, law, and human rights, and uh, to learn also something from history, which is probably useful for the future. If you go back to the um, development of technology, and I think the first speaker brought us back into the uh, 1940s and 1950s, when all this technology started, then you can learn something from previous communication technologies, not only from the 1940s and 50s, but from the 19th century, uh, this when uh, the telegraphy um, was invented, and then later in the early uh, 20th century when broadcasting was invented. The interesting thing is if you compare this uh, introduction of communication technology with the introduction of the internet and, and put it into the legal discussion, then you see a huge difference. Um, after the invention of the telegraph, immediately, um, telecommunication law was adopted on the national level. And the same happened with broadcasting. When broadcasting was invented, immediately the governments adopted or the parliaments adopted a broadcasting law which regulated very specifically what is allowed, what is not allowed in this new field of technology. And later then, the governments uh, negotiated a treaty based on the national sovereignty, you know, how to organize the cross-border flow of information via the telegraph or via wireless telegraphy and later via broadcasting. We have a number of conventions, and the ITU is one example for that because the ITU convention goes back to the eight, eight, uh, year 1865 when, um, based on a number of national uh, legislation for telecommunication, then a number of governments agreed, you know, how to organize uh, the transborder uh, telegraph flow. But with the internet, you know, and this is a surprising thing, this is rather different, because when the internet was introduced, or, you know, started with the uh, ARPANET in the late 60s and then in the 70s with the TCP IP protocol, uh, neither the United States of America nor other countries had the idea to introduce an internet law, like a broadcasting law, or telecommunication law. So that means more or less the internet developed in a bottom-up way in the shadow of governmental regulation. And the regulation of the internet was done not by the government or parliament, it was done by the provider and the user of the services themselves. They created, you know, their mechanisms where they said, okay, here we need a certain rule that it functions, and so we saw the emergence of um, rule-making 
uh, organizations in a bottom-up way, like what we see today as the IETF, which makes standards and protocols for the Internet, the World Wide Web Consortium, regional Internet registries, and all this was a self-organized system. And, um, you know, which was not based on the principle of national sovereignty because the Internet does not know borders, and though the whole concept of regulating the Internet was totally different from the concept of regulating broadcasting or telecommunication, and this creates one of the problems today, because in some countries, uh, some governments have the idea that the Internet is just an extension of telecommunication or of broadcasting, and they try to adopt this type of legislation to the Internet, you know, which creates now the conflicts we see, for instance, in the forthcoming conference in Dubai. The, the, the interesting point here with the um, regulation of the Internet via codes, protocols, and things like that was put uh, into the spotlight by a very important book by Larry Lessig in uh, 1998 when he wrote a book, Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, and he made clear that in cyberspace, it's code which regulates the Internet, probably not national law. And this is really very important to understand the differences. While in the old time. It was the, the, the lawmakers which defined the space for technical innovation. That means uh, when you used, for instance, a, uh, a frequency outside the, uh, the broadcasting law, this was illegal. When you used a device outside the licensed uh, devices for broadcasting or telegraphy, this was illegal. That means the law defined what, uh, which technology could be invented or not. So it means the lawmaker created the space for the code makers. But nowadays it's the code makers which create the space for the lawmakers. The code makers are much faster and you know with all codes and protocols like for instance the MP3 protocol for music. So they have created a new space which now the lawmakers have to fill. So that means if you compare the role of the code and the lawmakers then you see, you know, you see a tremendous shift. So the code makers are now sitting in the driver's seat and the lawmakers are hunting behind this development and try to fill the gaps which are you know, uh, emerging because the, the code makers create new spaces which are very often not regulated by traditional law, which are just regulated by codes, protocols and things like that. I think this is a fundamental, fundamental change uh, because all laws are adopted in the past with a bottom-up governmental controlled process while the codes are uh, in a top-down governmental controlled process while the codes are developed in a bottom-up process where everybody can participate not only the elected lawmakers in the national parliament and also uh, while in the parliament you need 51 percent to adopt the legislation so here in the ITF environment you need rough consensus to, to adopt the code so there are different principles which really now come together and create a lot of uh, future problems because question is the accountability, for instance. I think uh, lawmakers, you know, are elected uh, by democratic elections and they have accountability to their um, uh, people who elect them. But what about the accountability of the code makers? Because code is also made by men and you can make good code and you can make bad code. A code can open avenues, but it can also close uh, streets. So I think this is really an issue which have to, uh, we have to study much more. What is the relationship between lawmaking and code making in a global environment where national borders play only a small role? And I think this is leads then immediately to human rights because you know the um, uh, one of the freedom uh, is certainly you know the uh, w what we call today the freedom uh, of expression, but also the freedom. Uh, um, to, uh, to innovate. Um, while I said, you know, in the old uh, telecommunication world, this was, uh, you could have innovation only with permission. If you invented something, you needed then a permission to use this. So, but the internet is innovation without permission. There is no need to ask. Larry Page did not ask somebody whether it's allowed to start a search engine or not. Mark Zuckerberg did not ask whether it's allowed to start a social network, yes or not. So he just did it. So, and this is also a new challenge. So we are seeing a lot of things where the traditional top-down legislation processes nationally and internationally are now partly uh, complemented
but also already partly substituted by a bottom-up process where the policy is made not only you know, by one stakeholder, by a lot of stakeholders. Civil society have a word in this, the Thai private sector, the technical community, and government certainly also needed in this process. And this is a big challenge ahead, uh, and the human rights issue is certainly in the center of it. Roxana quoted already the uh, famous resolution from the Human Rights Council, Council adopted in July this year. We should be aware that this existing uh, law is really important also for the, which was for the offline world existing, important for the online world. And sometimes some people argue, okay, we are now in cyberspace, we need new laws, we need new human rights or things like that. So I think the cyberspace is just an extension of our reality. And if we have laws in the real world, so then there is no need you know, to reinvent everything. We can 99% of the existing laws can be used also for the online world. A crime is a crime and it is a crime. I think if I steal money in the real world, you know, it d does not, you know, stealing money in the online world is, is the same crime like in the real world. There is no need to have new cybersecurity legislation which would forbid, you know, stealing money online because it's already in the existing criminal law that stealing money is illegal. And with a lot of other things also, that the existing legislation, both in human rights and also in other fields, is very often sufficient enough to deal with all these challenges. So that means I would um, close here with um, the, uh, a, 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 a certain, um, I would not say warning, but you know, I would recommend uh, parliaments and governments to be very careful if they move into the field of new legislation for the cyberspace. Because a lot of the issues which are um, you know, at stake uh, whether it's cultural issue, content issue, uh, security issues, uh, property issues or whatever, are already regulated in national legislation and in international treaties and there is no need to introduce new legislation. There could be a need, but you should be very, very careful before you start new legislation. What is the subject of the regulation? Because very often, introduction of legislation has unintended side effects and sometimes you know you want to repair something but at the end you destroy a mechanism which works thank you uh, thank you very much Wolfgang. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we start the session of uh, questions and uh, general discussion please uh, first of all questions from uh, our Please. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, I'm in internet. Uh, no. Ah. Emil Gar from uh, Information Technology University. Actually, it's not a question. I just want to add uh, some notes for for Andre's speech uh, uh, when he meant about the uh, server installed in some location and the users in other administration in other location. Uh, so that uh, I know that the UN uh, they released a new law. Uh, so if the crime appear in some uh, in some country. And you have to bring in if this uh, the man or uh, any person uh, from other country, they have to bring it back and judge them in here native country. But now they uh, release the new law. Uh, if the uh, the person did uh, the crime in this city, they can immediately judge them in the same country. So I guess the UN will be uh, create the new uh, new law for internet when, uh, as Andre said. Uh, if he did something wrong, they don't have to search and write in other uh, uh, ju uh, ju in other country where the court located. So uh, I guess uh, this law will be implemented also in virtual world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Have you some comment? Yes. Uh, I have a comment. Thank you very much for your attention to my report. And I'd uh, like to say that first that 
the issue of jurisdiction in cyberspace is one of the most difficult issue now in all uh, uh, legal s s scope of the internet governance issues so that I think that uh, personally I suppose that we need uh, as you said the UN law uh, the international treaty uh, w which uh, regulates the issues of jurisdiction within the internet which we defined uh, sp especially uh, counteraction towards cyber crimes. Thank you very much. Roxana, maybe you want to add something, or Mikhail, or somebody want to add? No. Okay, another question. Maybe remote, remote question. Question from remote participant. Ah. Uh, the question to Andrei Sherbovich, how we can protect content in open network? Uh, the, uh, very interesting question. At first, I'd like to ask a question back. What is the open network? The Internet itself is the open network. Uh, there, are, there are no closed uh, internet as, uh, as in different countries like uh, maybe North Korea is very close internet they have c a computer network but there are no internet inside but uh, how to protect uh, uh, information uh, in the open network uh, it's uh, I think a very simple uh, question and, is and the complicated is in the same time uh, as far as we protecting uh, information offline, we should uh, maybe, uh, is it possible to uh, re ar arrange application uh, different uh, on offline laws? It's the one one way of protection information in the internet and the open networks. The second uh, solution of this is uh, to create and establish a special different rules towards internet and other networks inside the internet uh, the third uh, uh, question is protection of the open information in the internet by uh, developing the network communities on the third level internet governance it's uh, I don't know what which way is more uh, simple and which way is correct I think most of them and they complicate uh, coordination between these three decisions would be the best way to protect information in the open network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. And the next question from uh, remote participants uh, to Roxana. How do you see the optimal balance between the private and public in the internet? Yes, I really wish I had a, qu uh, I had a solution to that. <laughs> we would be out of here in a couple of minutes and we would I just start uh, doing something else. Um, I think this is a this is a um, question that everybody is actually trying to answer right now. Uh, my own insight on it is that um, we we still need a degree of uh, public regulation, but we need to make sure that that doesn't go in directions that have um, a lot of predictable unintended consequences. And at the same time, uh, with the private sector, we can notice a series of initiatives of uh, like self-organized coalitions that are trying to push forward the accountability for human rights online. Um, also, different types of uh, corporate responsibility programs that actually try to increase access to the internet and uh, some degree of transparency, which I think they are all positive. So I would just leave it at that, that uh, we see some efforts made in, a, in the direction of striking a balance, but um, it's still developing. Uh, thank you, Roxana. Maybe somebody want to add? Uh, um, yeah, I also would like to um, uh, add some comments. Actually, I think that um, with the integration of digital signature 
um, you know, uh, all over the world, not just inside one particular country, but help us to directly define uh, what is private and what is public. Uh, for instance, if you know some information is uh, signed by the by by your uh, digital signature, it might be, um, you know, it might show that it's probably your private information, and if it's not, then probably it's a public one, right? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, maybe uh, somebody have uh, any question, or please, please. Uh, I just want uh, to add a okay, that how to protect the open data. What kind of data it is? Uh, yes. What kind of data it is? Uh, we have a lot of now today. We have a lot of software. May, uh, of course, you can install the firewall. Or we have the, the uh, secure uh, PPS, SS, SSL, can, uh, can install a local LR. So still open network, but it's closed from inside. So uh, just, uh, I guess, it's a lot of ways to protect the data and still uh, uh, have it in the open network. Thank you very much, uh, Mikhail. You know. want to? Uh, oh. Okay, please, uh, your question. <laughs> yeah, my, my question relates to the new internet blacklist in Russia. Um, and I, I, I'm just uh, wondering what, what safeguards are in place to, to prevent uh, this blacklist being used to, to censor censor content that is not liked by the government, censor content that is not liked by corporations, um, as well as to po possibly stop and censor protests both online and offline, and uh, whether any of the Russian panelists foresee this as having an impact on freedom of expression, both online and offline, freedom of association, both online and offline, and freedom of peaceful assembly, both online and offline. Thank you. Mikhail. Thank you very much for your question. Um, first of all, I would like to say that actually, um, you know, this new law and this uh, blacklist just started to work uh, since the 1st of November. But anyway, we already got six websites already put in the blacklist. And we've got, I think, more than 3,200 uh, 3, uh, inquiries uh, with the uh, you know, names of some particular websites uh, to the commission. The thing is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is no public control, uh, as I know, for uh, and, and, and the any uh, open discussions about uh, particular websites uh, which should be put in the blacklist. Uh, that's why I think it might uh, have special impact, uh, you know, to the probably freedom of, of, of uh, speech, right, of expression. And uh, um, I also would like to add that. Um, um, since we, we, we've got the blacklist, uh, it's quite hard to, at least right now, it's quite hard to control uh, and to see which, which websites are blocked, because uh, we have, you know, this uh, kind of uh, uh, input of information when we just type the name of the website and receive if it's blocked or not. And we don't have the full, you know, full list, the whole list, uh, just on the website, which means that uh, it's quite hard to see which websites were blocked. So uh, some websites might be blocked, and we wouldn't know about it until we just type the name of the website, right? And also, as we know, um, website is blocked by the government organizations, uh, which means that um, even if we have um, some protests offline or online, we wouldn't do anything. Uh, in until uh, there is a special court uh, dealing with this, uh, you know, with, with this problem. So that's that's what I would like want to add. And Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to add some uh, comments about uh, this problem of the blacklist. At first, uh, those blacklists are effective since uh, just first of November, so it's uh, not a lot of uh, days passed since the law was effective. At first, uh, sometimes uh, the law enforcement practice is not much more developed uh, according to this blacklist. It's only temporary regulations concerning uh, the efficiency of this blacklist. And also, those blacklists uh, is devoted only to 
or prohibit child pornography, not on other things on the internet, not other cyber crimes, just this uh, specific type of uh, prohibited content uh, should, could be placed into the, bl the blacklist. Also, I'd like to add to the, my experience, to the practical experience, that uh, sometimes uh, this blacklist works not uh, properly. The expertise of uh, uh, those people who uh, uh, providing expertise of the website before the prejudicial blocking, uh, uh, they are not clear because uh, they are uh, s sometimes they are living inappropriate content uh, uh, on the internet without taking them down. The third issue that in the Russian legal culture the applying for the crime is not uh, good from the ethical point of view. It's so uh, the historical uh, maybe uh, specialty of uh, Russian nature <laughs> than uh, if they are they have the a special form on the website, uh, governmental website, on which we, we could apply for this prohibited illegal content. But nobody will uh, apply for this uh, content in case of the specific, maybe s s some people are damaged by uh, contents of these uh, websites. Uh, in this case they will, will apply. But I don't. Uh, I think that uh, we need to, uh, some time to see how this black uh, this blacklist uh, is working to make some uh, maybe uh, sound uh, decisions uh, on this on this and its efficiency. But it's not the uh, the best way to prevent uh, uh, illegal contact on the internet. Uh, blacklisting. We know that exper Russian experience happens that, uh, but we have judicial uh, blacklist on the extremist website, which is judicial list, not only websites on placed on the, but also the extremistic literature and other, uh, which contains hate speech, uh, discrimination on national, racial, uh, religious nature. Uh, oh, uh, and, uh, we have uh, uh, experience of having this blacklist in Russia, but it's only judicial blacklist. Uh, also, uh, the, I, I would like to conclude about this judicial procedure. The judicial procedure, the trial uh, uh, in Russia is quite long. We have a red tape uh, specific uh, uh, within the Russia, Russian trial. It is very simple and very, very, s uh, 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 very short period of time to move this website to another domain and uh, to re-establish this website. So this judicial procedure of prohibiting this site is also still not effective. Thank you. Thank you, Andrei. Uh, another question, please. Uh, I believe there is a law 436FZ in Russia that, um, uh, sorry, I'm reading this online, that requires notices uh, about websites that are um, not appropriate for children. Um, I, I'm just wondering what type of technologies are required to implement such, uh, such a thing, whether possibly technologies like deep packet inspection are required, and again, the human rights impact. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the thing is, uh, when we're talking about uh, special technological uh, issues of uh, blocking, you know, the websites, uh, we are talking about uh, special uh, recognition algorithm used for analysis uh, analysis of the data on the website of the content. Uh, mostly, it's implemented right now for for the pictures, images and for the text. So it's text recognition on their top operator of, of uh, you know, on the, on the country space, I mean, on this level. And uh, after that, this operator uh, or content provider uh, sends a notification to special governmental structures saying that, you know, there's an inappropriate content probably coming from that side or another one. And it might send official uh, 
uh, notifications to, to the local uh, content providers or internet providers saying that you should block the website or, you know, if it's localized uh, from which place, if it's a country server or, you know, somewhere in the country, if it's localized, it's always they will block it immediately after the decision or the notification of that uh, top uh, content provider. That's how it works. And technological aspect is just uh, recognition of uh, different pictures and uh, just comparing with some, you know, databases and with a set of uh, some, you know, inappropriate content. So, thank you. The problem with these is that there's always, uh, firstly, over blocking. I in other countries where we've had um, child pornography block lists, they've also blocked legitimate content such as um, uh, sex education sites for teenagers, that sort of thing. Um, so the other problem is that uh, the lack of transparency is inherent to blocking of, of uh, child sex abuse sites because the authorities don't want you to be able to see what's on the list because they don't want you to be able to go and, and check out the uh, sex abuse sites, of course. So um, this is a real problem. Uh, and the, uh, the third problem is that it just, uh, well, it's not really a problem, um, but uh, the internet is designed in such a way that I anything that's blocked you can route around and get to. And so there are technologies such as Tor, um, which can be used, and also encrypted VPNs, which can be used to get around these blocks. So we think that a much, well, when I say we, um, this is <laughs> maybe I think, um, that uh, a more productive avenue is um, to go after this, the production of this material at the source. Um, when we have, um, you know, crimes committed, we don't go after those who report the crimes or who disseminate information about the crimes, we go after those who commit the crimes. So really that's the most appropriate way to deal with um, the distribution of illicit material. I think this is a similar lesson Germany learned here also. Uh, we had in a discussion in another session today the terminology placebo uh, legislation. That means that, you know, there is an outcry in the society. Governments do not understand the internet. They want to do something and the easiest thing is blocking and filtering. So, but this is indeed, as Jeremy said, this doesn't work. That's, that, that's, uh, I would not say it's nonsense, but because it has some intention and probably not the protection of uh, children is, th is the main intention. You have other intentions in it, but this is a different story. But um, the only way really is to go for the criminals who produce the criminal content and not just to close your eyes or the, you know, that others, you know, blocks your eyes. This makes no sense. This does not work. And if you trust the technology, then, you know, you should learn something from the Green Dam project in China. They wanted also to block uh, pornography on the internet and they used a special um, you know, um, picture recognition technology. And so they filtered out, you know, websites where you had a, a lot of, you know, which you can, uh, could identify as necked skin, but it was only white necked skin. So that means while they eliminated all the porn sites, you know, with, uh, with white people, all the porn sites with black people, you know, were not filtered out because the technology was not able to make this difference between black naked skin and white naked skin. So that means you have to, uh, it's a permanent hunting then for new technology. Technology plays a certain role, but you should not trust technology. Technology, can you give also the, uh, uh, a better advice? Thank you very much. Um, maybe another question or? Yes. Thank you. But shortly, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, shortly. Uh, this uh, legislati legislative poli uh, po policy uh, on which blocking and filtering uh, is the only way, uh, it de depends on the content of the internet, uh, of the Russian segment of the internet, of the Runet itself. You know that there is not... Uh, uh, everything clear on the internet. For example, I know that uh, some years ago, now it is uh, the much better situation is the much better. The uh, child pornography was in open access on the ma major social network of uh, r in Russia. That's why the block and filtering policy is uh, maybe the only and the last uh, positive uh, could have positive effect on this. Uh, if other measures, for example, uh, establishing a legal culture and information culture of users and other uh, uh, things which could uh, 
help users to make uh, their uh, behavior inter on the internet appropriate to the uh, laws and to the rules of maybe human moralities as well, maybe uh, possible, like in other uh, development, uh, dev developed your jurisdiction on the internet. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want uh, to thank all panelists. Uh, I want to thank uh, the member of our, our audience and uh, our remote participants for active discussion. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the IGF uh, organizers uh, for um, this good opportunity to discuss these important uh, problems. Thank you very much.